Y Hot Springs, Arkansas, USA. Good evening, friends. It's really a grand privilege to be here tonight. And one thing to be back in Arkansas, and another thing to be on the campgrounds. I believe this is my first camp meetings that I have attended for a long time and had the invitation to come. And to begin with you, and I heard since you've just come in, you've been having a wonderful time here at this meeting. I'm so thankful for that. And I, coming up along the road just a few moments ago with my son, and we were talking about years ago when I first came down here to Arkansas, was the first time of my meetings. When I first started off, it was in Arkansas, in the evangelistic type of the meetings now, anyhow. And since then, been seven times around the world, and now back in Arkansas, it's like bad money, always returns it. I have everywhere I've been, I suppose, in the United States, I've asked any people here from Arkansas. I've always had friends from Arkansas, pretty near everywhere. And I've always said some of the truest hearts I believe that ever beat was under them, old blue shirts down here in Arkansas, real fine people. I love you. And I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to be back tonight in Arkansas, be here with you. And so I think we've got three nights yet left in the convention and to have the opportunity to come in and express my love to Jesus Christ and have fellowship with you people and our fine bunch of brethren here, who many of them I don't know. I just looked around and seen one that I do know by the Jack Moore. And I happened to, uh, and Sister Moore, happened to recognize them then and certainly happy to be in. Now I know all day long you must get tired, you know, physically tired. We never get enough of, get tired of praising and blessing God for his goodness, how wonderful he is. And, but all day long, and then when nighttime comes, then here I come in. And a kind of one of those ministers has been given the idea of speaking a long time, but I don't think we'll do it now because of this squeeze in the convention. We have had great speakers, no doubt, all through the day and through the convention, and then to stand up here on the platform. Why? Before all these fine speakers that I feel pretty small and stand here. One of the ministers I just shook hands with told me, this is your first services to have in this tabernacle, I would call it, I don't know just exactly what this temple or whatever it is. And we are suddenly thankful again for the opportunity to come into a new church, something that's directed to the praise and glory of God. How wonderful. And we are just moved back or not moved back, just come back from the, for the school vacation for the children. We live in Tucson, Arizona now, and it's been awfully hot out there, but we find that it's a little bit hotter here at home than it was out there because of the tremendous humidity. And it kind of puts us down after getting kind of used to the air there. We're going home and the first service last Sunday, and we see the Lord Jesus continuing his great work of love and power among the people. And the same gospel that I preached to you 15 years ago, here in Arkansas, I still believe the same thing, just don't change it, is Christ. Sunday, there was something taking place at the church. Just happened to look around and see the gentleman on which the miracles performed. Notice, we all love to brag on the Lord Jesus. We love to. I had a woman one time told me, she said, that's the only fault she could find with me. I bragged too much about Jesus. I said, I'll sure go to heaven if that's all the faults I had, bragging on Jesus. And so she, she just didn't think he was divine. She tried to say he was just a man and a philosopher or prophet or something on that order. But I said he was God. And so we, and she said, I can prove to you that he wasn't God. And I said, oh, I don't believe you can do that. She said, oh, I can prove he was only human. I said, now, I'll admit he was human, but he was both human and divine. She said he couldn't be divine. And I said, oh, he was divine. And he is divine. She said, oh, he couldn't be. I said, I'll prove it by your own Bible. I said, all right. And she said on St. John 11th chapter, on the road down to the grave of Lazarus, the Bible said Jesus wept. I said, well, what's I got to do with it? She said, well, if he, if he weeps, he proves he's not divine. I said, lady, your argument is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken and stabbed to death dead. I said, you know better than that. I said, he was human as he went to the grave of Lazarus, crying, that's right. And when he straightened out his little shoulders up and said, Lazarus, come forth and a man has been dead for four days, stood on his feet and lived again. That was more than a man. 
I could do that. I still believe him to be that. Sunday was speaking. We, I was asking the people to turn around in a tabernacle and shake hands with each other. And there was a dear friend. I've just learned to love him. He, he just come into the church, he and his wife. His wife is a registered nurse, and he himself is an Englishman. He's an Norwegian. How that ever happened, I don't know. But however, they're both fine people. And this brother had has had a little something wrong kind of in his heart. He's a very fine Christian man and an intellectual man too. He does secular work for accountants and so forth, but he turned around and when he did, a attack struck him and he pitched over on the floor dead. And his wife, being a nurse, grabbed him quickly and grabbed his pulse over his heart. He's gone. And I looked at his face real dark. His eyes were turned back, not just closed his eyes, but his eyes pushed out in front. And he was, I come over to the platform, tried to get the audience quietened. Many people were trying to help the sister, of course, in that condition with her husband. Someone laid something over his head, or under his head rather. I took a hold of his heart to his pulse at his arm, and no more pulse than there is on that piece of wood. And then I knelt down and I prayed, Lord Jesus, I pray thee to give back our we his life. And his heart beat four or five times and started off beating regularly again. And he came back up again and was trying to talk. He couldn't talk. He was, the blood stops, you know. When the heart stops and it was quite some time before he got his blood circulating went just right. And I had him call my name. And then I got back in the platform. By the way, I wonder if you just stand up so the people could see who the man was. That's a man that dropped it Sunday morning of heart attack, sister away, his wife and us, who's standing there to take his pubs to see and see that he. So I, that sounds very strange, maybe to people who wouldn't believe these things, but I have seen the Lord Jesus raise the dead many times, and that's not new to us. So we wouldn't, I think it's fine to brag on Jesus. But I think it ought to be some truth. What you are bragging about. So you have seen him, I've seen him in the last 15 years. Of my, in many infallible cases raised up the dead. Especially one in Mexico where Brother Mo and I were standing in the Mexico City. A little baby died one morning at 9 o'clock with pneumonia in the doctor's office. And the little woman, we couldn't get her to the well. The man had given out all the prayer cards and we just had to number them as they would come up. There wasn't normal prayer cards, and the little Spanish sister, about, I guess, 25 years old, had a little dead baby, and it was raining, and she had it under a blanket. And the night before that, there had been a blind man that was probably as old as my father would be, probably 75, probably 70 years old blind, and received his sight when I was praying for him. And that night, platform, practically, as well as this is across here, was just strict ricks of or way high two or three feet with just shawls and hats and garments that have been laid up there and this little woman was trying to get up there and before my son came and said dad i got pretty near 300 ushers there and all 300 can't hold that little woman she had a dead baby under her little blue blanket i said well i said to brother jack Moore, go down brother jack Moore and i have a lot of things in common I don't want to say we look alike because he's such a handsome man. But one thing about the more with the path are here the same way. We have a lot of things in common. I thought she never did know me, had to let me down on some ropes and things to get in. So I went down to pray for the little baby. I thought, well, they won't. She'll never know the difference. And so I was started to speak again when Brother Espinoza know many of you brethren know him from the West Coast and doing the interpreting. This was out there by the bull ring in Mexico City and I looked out over the audience and I seen a vision of a little Mexican baby sitting smiling at me. So I said, bring the little lady here. So I laid hands upon the little deaf, stiff, cold form. His feet began to kick and begin to scream and there he was alive and I sent a runner Espinoza did to check with the doctor to get a statement before we could read it out and the doctor wrote an affidavit that, that baby died that morning in his office about nine o'clock and this was about 10 30 that night and the baby was living today enjoying good health to the honor and glory of god so seeing many things take place we wouldn't have to see about our brother way there but truth is truth and god doesn't do these things just to he wants it to be known 
and people to know that he loves them. And by the grace of God, by the way, sits among us tonight, living, we're thankful for that. I thought, being on the campground, coming in, just don't want to interrupt the great time. Billy was telling me this afternoon, said, you talk about real old-fashioned Pentecost, said, you wait till you get up there, said, they sing like they have had the experience for 50 years. I said, I guess some of them has here for 50 years. And I just love to get into a meeting like that. I believe every one of us do, where we just get right into it. Like I used to tell a little story about fishing. Up in northern New Hampshire, I was fishing for trout. And way up at the head of the mountain, I had a little tent sitting up there. And those little A tent little pup tent from the government and I had found a place where there was many trout was back under a bush bush and there was a moose willow there and every time I tried to wet my fly why it would catch in the willow. So that morning I got up, went up there early and I thought I'd cut the willows down. I'd just uh, if I killed a fish then I would eat it. Otherwise I would turn it loose. So I had all week all I could take care of and I was up there by myself and while I was gone that morning, on my road back, an old sow bear and two little cubs has got in tent, my tent. And you talk about wrecking things. They really had wrecked it right. And they had tore everything up. And I thought, when I come back, I had a noise. And I looked around some little bushes I was coming around. And the old mother bear and all of them was just having them a time, wrecking through everything. And she saw me, and she ran off and called two little cubs. One of the cubs come and the other one didn't come. Little bitty fellow, spring, he was just as so high and he was sitting like this. And I thought, well, what's the little fellow so interested in? And I got around and looked. I said to her, get out of there, get out of there. And he just sit there, I thought, and I watched the old mother because, you know, to fool with her cubs, she would scratch you, you know. So I watched. There's a tree pretty close, you know, and had an old rusty pistol laying over there in the tent. Was where we broke up then. And anyhow, I wouldn't want to shoot the old mother and leave two orphans in the woods. So I kept watching this tree, getting around to see what the little fellow was so fascinated. And you know, I like pancakes. We, we're all southerners, aren't we? Flapjacks is what they are down here, you know. So, and I really love them. And I know there's not much when it is about me. I really like to pour on the molasses. I really baptize them right, pour it all over them. So I don't like just a little bit of sprinkle like you get in these places here, a little thing. I like to get where you really pour it on, you know, and get them mixed good and heavy. I had me a half a gallon bucket full of good old sorghum. This little bear had got the top off and he was really enjoying the molasses kept watching him around the corner. He take his little paw and stick down in his bucket, you know, and he didn't know how to get the molasses out. So he just stick in his paw down in my molasses and then rake it up and lick when he come down. I tell you, when I finally got around and got his attention, he looked at me, he couldn't see me. He was molasses from the top of his head all the way down. His little belly was just as full of molasses and his eyes, he couldn't open his eyes to look at me you know trying i thought that's right there's no condemnation to them that's eating puts in the mind of a good old pentecostal meeting when we get our arms down in that honey jar about that deep you know of that pentecostal honey you know the strange thing about it after i got his tummy full and my bucket sopped out he went over to his mommy and a little brother and the mommy licked him so you know I hope we get so much on us here that when we go home, those who didn't come will lick off of us. A little of experience. Tell them about how great things the Lord has did down here in Hot Springs, the Lord bless you. And now I believe they told me that they didn't get it in time or something another to announce to give out prayer cards to pray for the sick. Some numbers on cards, we call them and pray for them. And now like that, so it's give me one night to kind of get acquainted. And so tomorrow night, I think they're going to give out their prayer cards sometime in the afternoon. Is that, yeah, they're already six o'clock, six o'clock tomorrow evening. Now I thought tonight, we just a little portion of the scripture here and read it and see if we will 
could find what the Lord would have to tell us. And now just before we open the book, let's speak to the author of the book as we bow our heads. Before we pray and your heads bowed and all the cares now, the frolic of the day and the little senses of humors we've had, let's just push it aside now because we're approaching the king. Is there any special request I'd like to be remembered? Just would you raise your hand and say, Lord, write down in my heart, just hold your request. Hi, Heavenly Father, we deem this such a great privilege a great privilege of God Almighty to come into the congregation of the Lord to worship together, testifying, telling of the great things that you have done and the places that we have been. And it just reminds me of Acts 4 in the Bible when they returned and were speaking of what the Lord had done, and they all prayed. And the place was shook where they were assembled together. God, we are not so anxious tonight to see the building shook. But we would like for you to shake us, Lord, shake our understanding, shake our being, our emotion, our hearts of understanding that we might live here tonight more determined than ever to serve you. That we might feel the presence of a new, fresh Pentecost, of a Holy Spirit pouring out upon us afresh and anew, like down in these woods and hills in Arkansas, 50 years ago, when the forefathers come through here in horses and wagons preaching this gospel, dear Lord, may we, the bearers of this great worthy cause that you have sent through here, May we not be ashamed of this great thing, but may we walk in the footsteps of those who went before us, Lord, packing the banner of the Lord Jesus. May others who have not yet accepted this great plan of salvation that God laid down for us in the scripture, foretold all the way down to the Old Testament, and today we are enjoying it. May there be a great shaking among us, Lord, and a renewing of faith and a renewing of efforts. I thank you for this convention, for this bunch of people who are still holding on, Lord, in this hour of trial has come upon the earth to try those who are professing to be Christians. May we be found at the end worthy to enter into the joys of the Lord that has been prepared for the redeemed since the foundation of the world. Bless the world. Lord, remember every hand that went up. You know the objective, you know the motive, you know the request behind that hand. I pray God that you will grant to each it to each one, may every man, that woman, boy, or girl that put their hand up their hand that wanted more salvation or closer walk or to know you as your savior, may they never leave this ground till that request is answered. To those who are sick and needy, we pray God there will be such a wave of healing across this place that there will not be a feeble person that comes on this ground will live in the way that they come on. You who can raise a man up from the dead and present him here before us, it shows that in the same God that stood there by the grave of Lazarus called him out from among the dead. Father, let them know that you are the same as the dead forever. Here stands one among us tonight, just a few days ago, called back from the land beyond the shadow of a man's knowing in this life. How we thank thee for this. Bless us together now as we study your word, for truly the word is truth. Thy and thy word are one. They cannot be separated. So we ask your blessings upon us, Father, as we wait upon you to speak to us tonight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if you will, I'd like to turn to scriptures and so forth. I kind of laid down on the bed and went to sleep. The first thing you know, Billy, come up and said, let's go. Said, you mean it's church time? I had to pull out a little bunch of scriptures I had used before to speak on tonight. And I thought maybe it will be give out some cards and be praying for the sick and so forth. I've noticed since I've come in here, two people are laying on courts, perhaps come to be prayed for tonight. Now, and Billy come back, said, I just didn't get in in time. Daddy talked about it, said, we'll try tomorrow night. I said, all right, you get the brethren, give it, give some cards out. So now I want you to turn with me to the second book of book of Second Kings in the first chapter, and then also I want to turn in there to Jeremiah, the eighth chapter and twenty second of us. Let's read just a portion of the scripture. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Hazael fell down to the lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick, and he sent messengers and said unto them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Akron, whether I shall recover of this disease. But the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah the Tishbite, Arise and go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel, that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Akron? Now therefore thus saith the Lord God, Thou shalt not come down from the bed on which thou hast gone up, but thou shalt surely die, and like the departed. And then in the book of Jeremiah, the 8th chapter, and the 22nd verse, Is there no bug in Gilead? Is there is there no physician there? 
Why then is the health of the daughter of my people not recovered? I want to speak if we would call it on the subject, why? It's a question, and God is asking this question. And God is eternal. We know he is. He is everlasting. He never had a beginning, or he can never have an end. Eternity never started. It never ends, because it's eternal. And God cannot change his mind nor his way. And that's why that we as people who will not accept creeds if it's contrary to the word, because we believe that God and his word is the same. We believe that the Bible says in St. John, the first chapter, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made fresh and dwelt among us. Therefore, when God says anything, He cannot tomorrow or any other time ever take it back. When God is ever called on the scene to make a decision, and His one decision is eternal, it can never be changed. And God was called to make a decision for the human race. In the Garden of Eden, when the first sin was committed, could He ever be able to redeem His lost child back into fellowship with Him again? And He fixed one program, and it's never changed by the way of the blood. And for all the scriptures, it never did alter or change, and it never can because it's God's decision by the blood. Although we try to alter it, you have tried to educate it, you have tried to denominate it, you have tried to do everything there is in man's law to try to change that, like Adam did by the fig leaves and so forth, but it still ever remains the blood is the only place of worship. Therefore, together tonight, we can stand not as one denomination, maybe many of us together, but we can't stand here to represent one denomination. We have to stand here in this fellowship under the blood of Jesus Christ, we can all be brethren, sisters, God makes a way for man, and then man refuses to walk in that way. Then God has got a right to ask, why didn't you do it? And that's what he did then, and that's what he does now, and that's why he will, what he will ask at the judgment, they've asked why. Now a scripture reading started off, just immediately after the death of Ahab, a bad king, a borderline believer, a man who knowed what was right to do, and yet did not have the courage to step out and do what he knew it was right to do. I just think if this if this world isn't contaminated today with Ahab's, this Christendom that we live in, is contaminated with Ahab's, with a man who really know that it's right to give your life and be to God and be filled with the Spirit and follow the teachings of this Bible, and yet without the courage to stand and do it, reminds me again of another situation like that in Sodom. The Bible said the sins of Sodom vexed the righteous soul of Lot daily, and how that the art man's soul was righteous, and he looked out upon the sins of the land, and he knew that what was wrong, that they were doing wrong, and yet without the courage to stand for his conviction. No wonder the whole world has become a Sodom and Gomorrah, and how that the laws today across the nation and around the world standing in churches who is convinced that Jesus Christ is the same message then forever and that his power is just as real today as it ever was without the courage to stand in the pulpit and denounce sin because of some barrier that would excommunicate them from a fellowship that they had joined into still come back to the blood of Jesus Christ the only remedy why why Isaiah was the son of Ahab had been brought up in a kind of a home that was a lukewarm home. He wasn't altogether Christian. His mother was a heathen, and his father had married out of fellowship, married a woman that was not a believer. And that always makes a bad home for any kid to be raised in, that when unbelief and faith tries to mix it together. And now if the father would have been a real strong man in his faith, the child might have had a better opportunity. But he didn't. He didn't have. He knew that there was God. He knew that there was a Jehovah, and then he, his mother's gods, and so forth, he was all confused. Then after the death of his father, this boy in this condition kind of mixed up one way and another, and in that in a picture that runs today, one in the family is this way, and one another, and one going this way, and one going that way. No wonder we're producing such much juvenile delinquency, and all other kinds of stuff under the name of Christianity is because there is no unity. There is no real call out and stand for God. Now we find that this fellow falling heir to his father's throne one day, he, up at the top of his balcony somewhere walking around, he fell through the lattice, might have been over intoxicated and fell through the lattice, down probably on the bottom floor, struck a bench or something and broke a few ribs or bruised him up. And the sickness must have started on the infection somewhere or the bruise and caused him to have fever. And was pretty sick. Of course, them days they didn't have the remedies that they have now. 
Perhaps the doctors came and done what they could for the fellow, but they didn't have the sufficiency. Then he knew his only thing that he could do would be to go on a higher power than what the doctors could produce in the terminology of medicine. And he thought he would go then and he sent to his mother what a lesson that ought to be to mothers. A kid who usually listened to his mama. And he sent to his sent to his mother's god Belzebub over to Akron, where his statue was, his monument, and said, Go consult the priest over there, and let them consult the statue of Belzebub whether I will recover of this sickness that I have or not. But you know, that man really, could you imagine a people who are supposed to be a God-fearing people would let such a man rule over them? It's because of a local condition. It was a condition that the church had got into that put such a person in power or well, permitted it. I don't think times have changed very much. They still seem to be a whole lot of the same thing to a lot the same way. And let this man rule, have the say so over the country that would control some statue of a some pagan idea about his condition and then you know behind it all no matter how much it seems that god has turned his face from the people he does at some time to see what kind of an attitude you take every son that comes to god has to be tried and chastened and then there's a little spot in a man or woman when they're born of the spirit of god that's eternal and you'll get into a place sometime where to where everything that's human about you in reasoning, the devil can reason it away from you. But when it all breaks away, then if that eternal life isn't there, you will fall also because you can reason yourself away from God. But a man that claims to be a Christian has no right in the pulpit or has no right in the office, a leader anywhere, until first he has climbed them steps into a place to where he is born of the Spirit of God, filled with the Holy Spirit Ghost, in such a way that nobody can explain away from him. God, when he sent Moses down to Egypt to deliver the people, first he took him on the backside of the desert and then took all the theology he had in him out in 40 years and then appeared to him. He knew more about God in five minutes in the presence of that burning bush than he knew in the 40 years of learning he had, that he got. That's what the church needs tonight is another burning bush experience where slick tongue people where the scripture says that the two spirits in the last days will be so close it will deceive the very elected if possible. A man ought to first get on that sacred ground with God where all the theologians, all the doctors of divinity, all the reasonings, all the atheists, nothing else can ever explain that away from him. He was there when God came and he knows what took place. You can't reason it out of him. He was there when it happened. And that's the kind of man we need today in the government, in the church, and anywhere else in the times like this for leadership. We need a man that's filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what the church needs today, not a theologian, but a spirit-filled, born-again man, full of the Holy Ghost, I tell you. If we had more of that, the church would look a little different than it does in the present time. Things would be different if we just had more man filled with the God Spirit, not going after traditions of the elders and so forth. Now we find that this fellow sent up there to get this information from the gate of Ekron and Belzebub. But all the time God knew he was doing it. So he had a prophet down there by the name of Elijah. So he spoke to Elijah and said to go up there to a certain road and stand in that way messengers are coming up you see you cannot hide nothing from god see no matter what you're doing now how little did that fellow know that god was speaking to elijah way down there in the wilderness somewhere in a little mud hut somewhere and could tell him to go stand in the corner of the road up there and speak to these fellows and tell them to get back down to him and tell him thus saith the lord he's not coming off of that bed and he said, ask him, why did you do it? What makes you do it? Is it because there, there is no God in Israel? Is it because he doesn't have a prophet? Is that the reason he did it? Why? You know what happened. You know the scripture. You've got them in your own palace. The priests around there, no doubt, you've read the sins are boring. And why did you do such?